I'd like to introduce the first session, uh, which is on analytics and metrics. And uh, we're fortunate to have uh, two speakers that will be sharing some of their experiences in that area. Um, the, the first speaker is David Smith, who's from the University of Delaware. Um, and he has a PhD in uh, bacteriology. Uh, did a, a stint on the faculty there. I think emeritus now, is that your official title? Um, but he's going to talk to us today about uh, something that perhaps has nothing to do with uh, science, or maybe it does. Um, but uh, as we're now in a really uh, a global uh, industry, uh, apologies to those whose first language is not baseball, uh, but uh, David Smith is going to talk to us about sports metrics. Before we start, I have to try to be a little bit lighthearted, which is pretty much what I'm known for. University of Delaware is uh, unique in its mascot. We're the only blue hens in the world. Uh, the blue hen is a real animal. It's a fighting cock. There was a blue hen regiment of Delaware soldiers in the American Revolution and blue hen regiments in the Civil War. And so there is a mascot with that funny looking bird down there. There's also a real bird on the tie I'm wearing. Um, that mascot is called UD, capital Y-O-U-D-E-E, UD. And the UD bird is on everything at the University of Delaware. <clears throat> and in order to get permission to make your own special brand of UD, there's like four levels of vice president to go through. So th this is the biology UD that it took us a year and a half to get approved. So I have to show the, the biology UD because that is such a major political accomplishment to get it there. Okay, what I'm gonna do today is something that's very different from the conventional scientific talk I've given for the last several decades. I'm just finishing 40 years at Delaware at the end of this year. And I really want to talk about the increasing prevalence of large data sets, because this has led to sophisticated investigations in a lot of new areas, uh, some of which are rather different from traditional topics. My focus will be at the basic level of the philosophy of science and how baseball research is a good candidate for this type of examination. The acquisition of the baseball data, how we do it, is also going to be uh, considered. So what is science? If you do a, a, a several online searches, you'll come up with um, some, some different definitions. This is not an easy question to answer. But the emphasis is that it's involved with the definitions of questions, and then you develop the proper criteria for evaluating them. What I think is the best face on this is that a scientific approach is independent of the subject being analyzed. It is, there's no such thing as a scientific subject. There's a scientific approach. That is a huge difference to a practicing scientist like me. I think in modern times, this has been getting blurred. We hear about STEM technology, the science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, various legislatures have in incentives and innovative programs to encourage STEM research. The problem is that those start to miss the point of how the work is done, and they start focusing on what is being studied. And I think that is not a very productive thing to do. For example, universities are routinely divided into natural sciences and social sciences based on what is examined. This is not intellectually useful, in my opinion. In the 40 years I've been doing this, I've seen an awful lot of arguments because of it. There's also tensions between science departments and engineering departments due to what I see as the false distinction between basic and applied science. I don't think there is any distinction. I defer to the great chemist and, oops, and, where'd I go? Long word. And um, microbiologist uh, Louis Pasteur, who said there is no such thing as applied science. There are only applications of science. You don't do something differently because you're an engineer. You're just studying something that is different. Let me give you examples. Economics is certainly a scientific discipline. It's getting more so all the time. There's sophisticated computer models, some very complicated analyses that, that get done. That wouldn't fit into the kind of science that Pasteur would do. Climatology, meteorology depend very heavily on large computer models. So does medicine. Medicine is becoming more and more data-driven all the time. For traditional medicine for thousands of years was em empirical and experiential, and changes came very slowly and based on sort of gut feelings. Modern medicine is now very much based on rigorous data analysis, controlled experimentation, and modeling. So if we aren't defining science by what is studied, then what are the key features? And so here, oops, got the wrong slide. The key features to me are these, the definition of questions and the proper criteria for the evaluation. There's certainly room for debate, but I think these are the two central features that we need to consider. 
This is usually seen in the classical formulation of hypothesis, experiment, and conclusion. Controls are essential so that meaningful conclusions can be attributed to specific aspects of the experimental manipulation. Indeed, for almost everybody here today, that's how we learn science in the sixth grade. There's nothing magic about that model. We all could have recited that without me telling it to you. The physical sciences, including chemistry, are very well suited to that, as are some of the more biochemical and molecular aspects of biology, but not all of it. Not all areas of, of traditional science fit this paradigm so nicely. For example, astronomy is unquestionably a scientific discipline, and in fact, it is generally regarded as the study that began the scientific revolution in the early 17th century. However, this crucial pioneering science depended primarily on observation. We weren't doing experiments on Jupiter, we were observing it. And much less on manipulation the way we would see in the laboratory. Another area of inquiry that is near and dear to me is biological evolution. At various times, I've described myself as a microbiologist, an ecologist, or a geneticist, but above all, I'm an evolutionary biologist. And here's the slide I had before. 1973, Theodosius Dobzhansky wrote a paper entitled, Nothing in Biology Makes Sense Except in the Light of Evolution. We'll come back to that, because that's really an important point. It all makes sense of things. This leads evolutionary biologists to consider different kinds of evidence, and maybe in different ways. In addition to teaching standard biology courses, I've taught courses in the history and philosophy of science. I'm really fascinated by this. Without an organizing principle, a model, if you will, <clears throat> we are left with a number of special cases that have no obvious relation. For astronomy, this is the cover of Copernicus's book, 1543, The Revolution of the Celestial Spheres. And this is the cover, which has the Earth in the middle and all the different planets around the outside. This was the the groundbreaking new idea that the Earth was at the center. I assume it by putting, good work, the sun at the center. Anybody else want to come give this talk? Putting the sun at the center and having the Earth go, go around that. What was valuable about this is that it explained a lot of things all at one time. It explained changing the seasons. Before Copernicus did this, people had ideas about how the seasons changed, but they were sort of special case explanations. How does the day, day length, the amount of daylight every day, how does that change throughout the year? Uh, how about the retrograde motion of the planets? That if you look at the stars every night, Mars, for example, appears to go that way in the sky for part of the year, then it appears to go backwards, then it appears to go forward again. How do you explain that? There were very complicated explanations for that. And then the one that everybody was very excited about was predicting eclipses. Being able to predict an eclipse was a very special thing, had religious overtones, some very mystical things. Before Copernicus's model, these all had explanations, but they were all different. They were not connected to each other. Everything was a special case. And what Copernicus did in a single stroke by making his heliocentric proposal, by putting uh, the sun at the middle, was to explain all of them at one time. And basically, that's what evolution does as well. So let me talk about evolution as a, as a, a comparable thing to astronomy. That the first notion of uh, evolution that's important here is the idea, the difference between natural history and science. Now, natural history to me is like gathering a bunch of data. It's important to have a robust set of information or you don't have anything to study. But the collection of the data, the encyclopedic listing of things, isn't really a scientific endeavor. It's asking questions about that that turns out to be where the science is. Carl Linnaeus is the one who really devised the best modern system of taxonomy where he categorized thousands of species of plants and animals, but it was all descriptive. It had very little in the way of explanatory power. Alexander von Humboldt, uh, working some 30 years before Darwin, explored South America, made a lot of observations, but also offered some explanations. He didn't just say, gee, it's different here and here. I can try to explain why it's different here and here. That sounds like a small thing. It was enormous in 1820. That was a, a remarkable leap forward. This transition from natural history to questions, to, to science, to collecting the data, to asking questions. That transition is probably best seen in the person of Charles Darwin. Now, Darwin, 1838 there on the left, 1881 on the right. I, I like showing these two pictures because no one ever sees the left-hand picture. Everyone assumes Darwin was born at the age of 80, and he looked, looked like what he looked like on the right there. And indeed, he was at the end, but he was once a young man. And when he went on his one time he ever left England was a five-year voyage around the world on HMS Beagle from 1831 to 1836. He was only 22, so this is two years after he got back uh, from his voyage on the Beagle. 
His physician on the Beagle was naturalist. He was sent to collect specimens. He was sent to collect seashells and bird fossils and plant everything to collect natural samples. And during the five-year voyage, he collected some 50 giant chests which were shipped back to England at various times. The voyage was originally supposed to be a year and a half and it turned into five. And they ended up going around the world, which wasn't the original plan, but that, that's the way it ended up. And as he kept collecting these things, it occurred to him, there's relations between these. Once he got back to England, he took 20 years to put the observations together. He gets back to England in 1836. He spends 20 years going through his samples. And in 1859, he publishes Origin of the Species. So it took that long to try to organize all of these things. Evolution is often described as a historical science. Now, what does that mean? What is a historical science, which I'd like to explain, and I think baseball fits that very well. What does it mean? Well, evolutionary hypotheses and predictions are not about the future, but about an unknown past. Normally, when you have a hypothesis and a prediction, you're predicting something into the future. What evolution does is predict things we don't know yet, but things that happened millions of years ago. They're still unknown, so that prediction is a reasonable term, but it's a prediction about an unknown past. Now, let's give it a simple example. The idea originally that started this, that really gave people a lot of power, was looking at the evolution of the horse. Now, the top line is a picture of skeleton and skull and leg bones of a modern horse, and the bottom row is the mesohippus is a very several million years ago. Those two skeletons were well known, obviously the modern one, and the one at the bottom was, was well known. And so people didn't know about the ones in between. They said, you know, we think that there was probably a logical series of steps in between. And discoveries were launched, and you went out, and they found the fossils. So the historical prediction, the prediction of the unknown intermediates, was in fact fulfilled. I think that fits beautifully with the idea of a hypothetical prediction of, of what you would expect. It was something they didn't know then, but they then went ahead and found it. So it would be a comparable situation for baseball as a historical science, which I'm sure is a little strange idea for most of you, but I'm going to try to sell this to you. Let's get some specific examples. Is batting average the best measure of battery effectiveness? Now, for those of you who weren't really into baseball, this is probably not a fabulously interesting question, but it's something that baseball fans have worked on for 150 years. How do we tell if this batter is better than this batter? Batting average is simply the ratio of safe hits per at bat, that is, successes per opportunity. Sounds pretty good. That sounds like a reasonable thing to try to predict. And for the longest time, this was just accepted as, well, yeah, that's how you, you compare the best batters. There was no empirical explanation to try to explain why that would be true. And it turns out that it's not. It turns out that some, there's something more than just getting a safe hit. Getting yourself on base is pretty important. Getting a walk, drawing a base on balls, is almost, not quite as, but almost as important as getting a base hit. Getting yourself on base is important. Another thing after that is getting around the bases. I mean, baseball's pretty simple. You get on base and you go around the bases. So we should be able to measure those two things independently. What is your success at getting there? And what is, what, as you, for the subsequent batters, what is your success at advancing the guys that are already there? Those are the, the two basic things. And these have now come down to this combination called on-base plus slugging. And if you watch any baseball games, you see OPS being talked about all the time, where the, it is those two components. On-base is the measure of how well do you get on. And slugging is how well do you advance people. And just to be clear, slugging percentage is just like batting average, except it weights the value of the hit. So a single has a value of one, a double a value of two, a triple a value of three, and a home run a value of four. So the more long hits you get, the more you're going to be advancing people, and the more valuable it is. Well, those are great proposals. I mean, I can just tell you on base is better than batting average, but why in the world should you believe me? My whole point is to talk about large data sets and how we do the analysis. And so here's some real data. If you look at every game played between uh, 1901 and 2012, this is uh, 160,000 games that I analyzed. And the top graph shows the primary success. The y-axis is runs per game. That's the point of the game, is to try to score runs. So runs per game as a function of batting average. In the top panel, you see there is certainly a positive relationship. The teams that have more higher batting average are going to score more. Uh, R squared for that is 0.69. However, if you do the bottom graph, same seasons, and look at on-base plus slugging instead of um, batting average, you find the R squared is 0.86. 
I don't know about you, but in all my years as an empirical scientist, you know, you'd die for an R squared of 8.86 for anything. And so for having this kind of relationship, the explanatory power, which you wouldn't have if you didn't have 160,000 games to look at. That's, that's one of my key points about large data sets here. Now, this has come to a modern term called sabermetrics, which you may have heard about. And it comes from this. It comes from uh, an organization called SABER, which stands for the Society for American Baseball Research, and sabermetrics is just, just playing that around. It's a group of about 6,000 uh, baseball researchers. Founded in 1971, it's been it's ever since that time pretty much the center for, uh, for baseball research. Pretty much all the serious baseball research has, has begun there. The name that probably most people know about this is Bill James, and Bill James has become very prominent in excellent writing and doing detailed analysis. Certainly, he's certainly not the only one, but he was one of the first ones. When Bill started in the late 70s and early 80s, many people said, well, the data didn't exist, that nobody had the data to do what I just showed you in that last graph. That's not quite right. The analogy to me is the data was there, but it was incredibly fragmented. And to me, the analogy is imagine you've got 100 scholars each of whom has a wonderful library, but nobody knows about the other person's library. You've got 100 wonderful data sets, but they're utterly unintegrated, and literally the owners of one are ignorant of the others. That's pretty much where baseball research was in 1980. And since then, what has happened is we've all gotten to know each other, and we're sharing these things, and we have, have large, uh, very effective mechanisms for doing this. And so this has been an improvement, not just in data collection, but in data sharing, which is also part of the theme of what this conference is about. Bill led the first effort to collect play-by-play -play information. And to do the kind of questions I'm asking, uh, you really need to have that. You need to know what each batter does in every single game. So for example, what is the break-even point for caught stealing? What does that mean? If you steal a base, that means you advance the next base without the batter doing anything, that's a good thing. You have advanced a base. You've improved your chances of scoring. But if you're caught stealing, if you're thrown out, then that's a negative thing. Where's the break-even point? How often do you have to succeed to make up for the failures? And for the longest time, people said, um, sounds like 50-50 would be pretty good to me. Well, it turns out you can model this, and you can use my 150,000 games worth of data, and you find out that the break-even point is about 2 thirds. You better make it twice as often as you get thrown out. Now, it turns out that in the entire history of Major League Baseball, there has never, ever been a season in which stolen base percentage was over the two-thirds break point. Teams are running way too much and getting very little out of it. But that's, that's a, a different strategy point. Next point, how valuable is it for the first pitch to be a strike? This is almost a religion among pitching coaches. Uh, Larry Miller, who used to be a pitching coach of the Baltimore Orioles, said the best pitch in baseball is strike one. That if you get the first strike on the batter, then he's going to be in terrible shape. Well, it turns out it's not quite that simple. If that first pitch is a swinging strike, then it's a great advantage for the pitcher. If that first pitch is a foul ball, it turns out the batter does very well. Who would have dreamed that they're both strikes? Strike, swing and miss is strike one, foul ball is a strike one. Who would have dreamed that in fact it makes that much difference? And I looked at every pitch of every game from 1988 um, through 2011, I guess is when I did that. So this is something like um, eight million pitches or something that, that I looked at. And you find out that a strike is not a strike is not a strike. So again, you wouldn't know it unless you had this valid large data set. How about the myth of clutch hitting? This is all over all sorts of, of broadcasts. Well, this guy's really good, you know, in the eighth inning when the game's on the line, he's really a great hitter. And it's legendary, and you can pick your own favorite player. Yes, his overall record isn't so good, but he's great when the game is on the line. That always raises the question, why wasn't he so good earlier in the game? But, you know, that, that's a different question. It turns out it's not true. It just isn't true. Again, you can't do that unless you have all the raw data. We do now, and that is absolutely a myth. There's absolutely no question. Well, there are now companies that do this. There's no longer just amateur geeks like me doing this. There are, in fact, corporations that do this. The most prominent one is called Stats Incorporated, founded by my good friend Dick Kramer. Uh, they started doing baseball. Uh, they now do all sports as well. Some of the early clients for Stats were the Chicago White Sox and the Oakland A's. And if you ever saw the movie Moneyball, uh, that's the Oakland A's. It's, it's all of this stuff. That's, that's where they got all of their data. And I'm happy to say I consulted with people in that movie as well. They, they, they got the baseball stuff right. I'm awful pleased about that. Many teams now use sabermetrics routinely. 
notably the Boston Red Sox, because Bill James now works for the Boston Red Sox, and he's had a great influence on the way they are, are evaluating things. Well, it turns out that in addition to how the teams are evaluating it, and that creeps into the way announcers present it, fans have different expectations. And so here's a picture of a scoreboard at uh, Camden Yards in Baltimore last, um, last year sometime. And you see down at the bottom, there's Matt Weider's batting, hopefully everybody can read that, that gives his at-bats, runs. his batting average at that point is 246, his on-base is 310, his slugging is 440. Five years ago, no scoreboard would have told you what the on-base was or what the slugging percentage was. So this is progress. At least the Orioles have figured out that on-base and slugging are important. However, they're still putting up batting average because some things die hard, even in baseball, just like they do in academics. They have to cling to that, even though the, the um, uh, batting average by itself is not a, a fabulously um, uh, relevant thing. The um, collection of this data has been largely done by amateurs. This is something that, in my opinion, Major League Baseball should have done for 150 years, but they didn't because there's some real troglodytes running Major League Baseball who decided this stuff wasn't important until all of a sudden it was made prominent for them. And the organization which I founded is called RetroSheet, you know, clever old score sheet. And our, our job is to have a bunch of volunteers that organize this massive data. That's where the 150, 160,000 games come from. That we organize this stuff, not only uh, in, with lots of, of games, which of course is really important, but it's got different aspects to it. We collect it, we digitize it into a usable computer form, and then we publish it. It's published on our website for free. Now there's an open source data set of, of some enormous size that you're all welcome to go get right now if you'd like. And this has led to a variety of sabermetric analyses. And I've done some of them, but there's a lot of people who use our data to do all sorts of things. And we have a statement on our website that users of this data are allowed to do anything they want with it, including giving it, selling it, making a professional product based on it, do anything you want with it. All I ask is that you acknowledge that you got it from us. And about 50% of the time we get acknowledged. But you know, it, it's a good start. So how do we do this? What is the starting material? How do I get data on a game that was played in 1935? And it turns out that we often start with something like this. Now you've all been to the ballpark and seen scorecards and you try to keep score of all that. So the job of our volunteers is to look at that, figure out what this fan, who's probably been dead 40 years, was doing, translate it conceptually into what was actually happening, and then convert it into a digital form which is usable and easily accessible. And so, for example, the file we end up with, and this is a small piece um, of a game, the first inning of the game played on April 15th, 1947, which turns out to be Jackie Robinson's first game in the major leagues, which I put up for obvious important reasons. So we have a space for comments there at the top. Uh, the Dodger manager had been suspended for associating with gamblers, who the manager was. Uh, debut game for Robinson, debut game for the manager, umpire. That kind of stuff is all that you want to go back and track, it's here. It's all in one place. Now I won't go through all of the individual plays. I mean, you play first inning for the visiting team, the home team, and I highlighted Robinson there in red. So now you know Jackie Robinson's first at bat in the major leagues, he grounded out to third base. So there's, there's your, your trivia question for the day. What we do with all of these, this information has several pieces to it, which are shown here. We collect the data and we computerize it. We verify it and then we do the analysis. What is the verification? I could look at that fan's scorecard, you know, maybe it's right, maybe it's not right. It turns out that one of the things that Major League Baseball has done well is to keep track of how each player does in each game. They have a daily summary for the player, not a play-by-play, -play, not an at-bat by at-bat record, but a game-by-game -game record. And that game-by-game -game record exists at the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, and they have kindly let us copy all of that stuff. I'm not, they're giant ledger sheets that have the daily record of each player. So after we get the score sheet, after we have the time to translate it, after we get it put into the computer, a process which is like 20 minutes per game, so multiply that times 165,000 games and you see how many man hours are involved in this. After we do that, then we compare the record for each player for each day that he, he participated in. Now there's certainly going to be errors along the way, but this level of validation I think is incredibly important. And it's something that I think doesn't get enough attention in some large data studies. That it's nice to collect the large data, 
But if you don't have a meaningful verification system for it, then I think you're really going to be missing something. But we also have to note clearly, this is completely technologically dependent. Let's say that in 1930, well, let's say 1980, the, the rise of the personal computer in the 1980s has made this effort possible. It's not just that it made it easier, it made it possible. Let's say that in 1980 I wanted to do a study, which I did want to, on the effect, the value of the stolen base. Well, great, all I have to do is sit down and go through 10,000 pieces of paper and count all of these things up. You're not likely to do that. So you have to have it in a usable computer format that is accessible that you can do the analysis on. So the rise in technology has not just driven the kinds of questions we ask, which it has, but it's also facilitated and made the whole thing um, you know, much easier than, than it made it possible what it wouldn't have been. So why is a professional scientist um, involved in this kind of thing? And for me, the answer is that the baseball came first. Uh, when I was about 10, I started collecting play-by-play -play accounts of, of baseball games off the radio. And uh, by the time I got into college in the late 1960s, it was clear I wasn't going to be the professional baseball player that I wanted to be. But I already had this sort of analytical point of view. I learned programming in college so that I could do baseball analysis. I took, that's true. I took three or four computer classes for the sole purpose of doing baseball analysis. And when it became clear that I was going to have to try to do something intellectual for a living, it was sort of natural that I became an empirical <laughs> scientist because it was the logical, organized, methodical examination of baseball data that sort of colored my world view. So it's not the baseball that led to the science, it's the, the, the uh, it's not science the baseball, it's the baseball interest that, that led to the science. So overall, I think baseball research offers unique opportunities to ask meaningful questions of this huge database in a scientifically rigorous way based on a large amount of reliable, systematically collected data. Thank you.